Sugar and its importance to Brazilian culture, featuring Eric Dahl, Sally Kramer, and Jerome McKeever. Sugar is a cash crop since 1532. On April 22, 1500, a Portuguese expedition led by Pedro Alvarez Cabral with three caravels, ten smaller ships, and 1,500 men landed in the city of Porto Seguro in the state of Bahia. At this time, the Portuguese only wanted to ensure the occupation, not the actual settling of the land they discovered. The only product of interest they found was Pau Brazil, which is used to dye fabrics a dark red color. This caused them to bring in the sugarcane crop and begin producing it in Brazil. The Treaty of Tordesillas, established in 1494, would divide the land discovered into two territories. The territory east of the line belonged to Portugal, and the territory to the west of the line belonged to Spain. Portugal divided Brazil into 17 hereditary captaincies, which are similar to provinces. By the time Portugal had introduced the sugarcane plant to Brazil in 1532, they had already introduced it to places such as Cape Verde and the Azores and Madeira Islands. Only two of these captaincies truly prospered with their sugarcane plantations, Pernambuco and Sao Vicente. Also at this time, gold held a similar value to sugarcane. These maps show the locations of Sao Vicente and Pernambuco. This is a depiction of the sugarcane crops and slaves in the 1600s. The sugarcane needs a lot of sun, a lot of heat, and a lot of water to grow. Sugarcane plants can grow up to 12 feet tall, sometimes higher, and the plants are usually harvested by machine today, although it is possible to harvest them by hand. And today, over 1 million people in Brazil work in the sugarcane and ethanol industry. The sugarcane plantations did not stay in the inland of Brazil. They spread out to the coastal areas as well, to places such as Sao Vicente. Today, Brazil produces 500 million tons of sugarcane per year, which is two-fifths of the world's supply. This number will continue to grow into the future. Continued growth is expected because of the use of sugarcane as more than just sugar in foods, but also as ethanol for fuel in cars and for cachaça. Next, we transition from the production of sugar to everybody's favorite drink, cachaça, also known as Brazilian rum. As you can see on the bottom left, we have a stock photo of some pretty sugar canes. And on the bottom right, we have the humorous poster reading, Only 1% of the water on Earth is fit to drink. Don't waste it. Drink cachaça. Cachaça's beginnings. First created from sugar brought to the Americas by the Portuguese between 1530 and 1550. Slaves used the leftover cane juice from sugar cane production and fermented and boiled it to produce a, produce a strong drink between 38 and 48 percent alcohol. This meant that it was originally thought of as a poor man's drink. Evolution of Cachaça Starting in 1850, the decline in slavery brought the new social group, the Barros do Café. The new elitists of Brazil wanted to separate themselves from the lower class with their rural habits and therefore rejected the national drink. In the beginning of the 20th century, Brazilian intellectuals went against the discriminatory position against cachaça. In 1996, President Cardoso legitimized cachaça in Brazil. Production of cachaça. Calda jicana, also known as cane juice, is first extracted from the sugar cane. The juice is then fermented for 24 hours and boiled until it's 80 proof alcohol. If bottled immediately, this forms white cachaça, as you can see on the left in the bottom right picture. Caramel can be added for a yellow cachaça, as you can see in the middle, or it can be aged like whiskey in barrels to form dark cachaça, as you can see on the right. The production of cachaça differs from rum because rum is produced from molasses, a byproduct of sugar production, while cachaça is formed from pure sugar cane. So like I said before, you take your sugar and you ferment it and you get the different types of cachaça. Here you have your white cachaça, 
which is generally used in mixed drinks like the Carpenina. Here you have a darker cachaça, which is usually drunk straight. Cheers. Cheers. Modern day cachaça consumption. Today cachaça is popularly consumed in the famous drink, the Caipirinha, which consists of cachaça, sugar, ice, and either lime or maracuja. Germany consumes the majority of cachaça that's exported in the world, taking in one-fourth of all of Brazil's exports. In the hope of turning cachaça into the new tequila, the Brazilian government copyrighted the name for the country's own sugar cane produced alcohol. June 12th is International Cachaça Day. The origin behind International Cachaça Day is on June 12, 1744, the Portuguese, feeling threatened by cachaça's widespread popularity among the Brazilian wealthy, banned its consumption. This only led to the drink becoming a symbol of Brazilian solidarity. Unfortunately, we'll be leaving on June 12, but before we leave, we should consume a lot of cachaça. Keep calm and drink caipirinha. Now, I'll be talking about the history of Brazil's ethanol production. Before I get into the history of ethanol, I'd like to briefly brush over the process first. So first, sugar must be grown and then collected. After cultivation, it is then fermented by microbes that act upon the sugar to create ethanol. To get the ethanol in a usable form, the ethanol must be distilled so the majority of the water gets taken out. The end product usually has around a 95% purity. Lastly, in the dehydration step, benzene and cyclohexane are added, then distilled to produce the end product, anhydrous ethanol. Brazil has produced ethanol for fuel in this manner since the early 1900s, producing up to 7 million gallons today. Production of ethanol started in the late 1920s and early 1930s. It peaked during World War II because German submarines threatened oil supplies, so Brazil focused on becoming more energy independent. The mandatory amount of ethanol required to be blended with gasoline got as high as 50% in 1943. <laughs> After World War II ended, gasoline started being used again as normal, and ethanol was only used in great amounts when there were sugar surpluses. It wasn't until 1970, during the oil crisis, that ethanol started become using, be, being used consistently again. This also led to the creation of the National Alcohol Program in 1975. To start phasing out automobiles, the Brazilian government started to require a certain blend of ethanol with gasoline in 1975. This amount fluctuated from 10% to 22% from 1976 to 1992. As a result of this mandatory blend, pure gasoline is no longer sold in Brazil, and the government continues to increase the minimum blend to this day, which is currently at 27%. Ethanol is extremely important to Brazil's transportation needs, and over 90% of the cars sold in Brazil today have flex fuel engines. So as you can see, it is a beautiful day here in the heart of Sao Paulo. We're filling up our cars with E85 ethanol. It's just a great day, and we're having lots of fun. The E85 is cleaner, it's cheaper, and it's Brazilian. In the top left corner, you can see that ethanol is sold alongside regular gasoline in all gas stations today, and at half the price, too. And in the bottom right, you can see the different varieties of flex fuel cars currently in Brazil. So Brazil's history with its large production of sugarcane since 1532 and the oil crisis in 1975 has had a huge impact on the way ethanol is consumed in Brazil today. Brazil's utilization of sugarcane has gone as far as becoming a power source in 1927. This is important because it helps make Brazil energy independent and self-sufficient. As part of this process that we saw firsthand, no part of the sugarcane plant is wasted. And Brazil's success with ethanol has contributed to its recognition as a developed country.